<laughs> Less than three minutes. Okay. You got to do what? Feel better. People that stop yeah. and have their battery stored. Their entire life together. Yeah, we're going to be there. Hey, Nick, are you on the Wi Fi? Did it plug in? No, I Wi Fi. Council, if you will come to order, it is 7 p.m. and all members of council are present. We do have a quorum. In just a minute, I'll ask everybody to stand. We'll be led in an opening prayer by Pastor Jeff Brooks of Lake City Church of Christ, and followed by that, we'll be led in a pledge to the American flag, followed by the Texas flag, and Councilmember Monger will lead us in that. Will you please stand? We begin tonight with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father God, we thank you for these servants, these men and women who serve in these roles of government. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, in the words of, of one great writer, that, that America would always be great because America is good. Father, help us to first be good so that we can be great. Father, we, we walk in the steps of, of great men and women, women like uh, Justice Ginsburg, whose loss we mourn greatly whose service we, we remember fondly, and whose example we follow in the footsteps of. Father, help us to govern diligently. Help us to serve with whole and open hearts. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Please join me in honoring our nation's flag. There is a flag in the back also. That's why the council is facing <laughs> that way. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. <coughs> It is time for public comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to address the council on any matter. The council is not permitted to take uh, to discuss or take action on any presentations made to the council. Presentations are limited to matters over which the council has authority. You may speak up to four minutes or a time limit determined by the presiding officer. Each speaker must complete a speaker's form and include the topics to be presented. You may also submit an email to mayor and council at trophyclub.org. We do have someone wishing to speak, and it's Kathy Palmer. Kathy, would you come to the podium? You're welcome to remove your mask. mask and I failed it that badly, so sorry. I'm just going to hold her up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Kathy Palmer, and Scott and I live at 40 Cypress Court in Hogan's Glen. We moved to Trophy Club 20 years ago and purchased our first zero-lot line home on Hannah Court, which now backs up to the new city hall. We had lived on Hannah Court approximately six years when we found out that there was going to be a three-story hospital built directly behind our very narrow, small backyard. 
In 2010, fearing this would compromise and destroy our lifestyle and privacy, we put our house on the market and started a search for another location where we could enjoy our upcoming retirement years. We chose 40 Cypress Court because of the lot offered another zero lot line property with a view of the once beautiful pond and eliminating any worries about anything interfering with our tranquil setting. We paid a premium for our lot that backs up to the water. Since the construction of PD30, we have brought drastic and dramatic changes in destruction to the ponds and surrounding property. We have watched excessive amounts of water with a force never witnessed by us in all the years we have lived here. We have witnessed large amounts of dirt, silt, trash, and debris flow into the ponds, causing erosion and water levels to change the entire life and beauty of the ponds. The failure of our recirculating ponds because of the excessive amount of dirt has also caused con concern for mosquitoes because of all the stagnant water. I am not an expert storm drainage, on storm drainage plans, but I do know that when Scott and I purchased a lot in Roanoke that was less than three quarters of an acre, that we were planning to change from all dirt and natural trees to concrete, we had to build a huge retention pond with a large number of small openings that would ensure the slow release of water during these rain events, preventing us from flooding any of the homes behind our business. The system designed and built in PD30 project has flagrantly failed to do that, in my opinion. The system built with the drastic slope that Scott and I now call the PD30 super slide exacerbates the amount and force of water that hits the creek, causing erosion and excessive dirt and silt to overflow and flood the stormwater system and pour into our ponds. This amount of water and the force that rushes into our ponds is proof that it is not functioning the way it should be. Another point I would like to make is that we were lucky to have several rain events in July and August, which prevented all of us from witnessing a mud hole instead of a live stream pond. It was well on its way turning into exactly that with our normal high temperatures and lack of rain in the summer months because of all the added dirt, silt, construction debris that filled our ponds. The ducks that frequent our ponds directly behind our house were able to actually walk side to side rather than swim. We were told that a restrictor plate had been added to help with the failed system. My neighbors and I have pictures and videos from the last two rains we have received since the addition of that plate that shows it may have helped some, but it still is not really enough. We are sick about the situation and have been told by our HOA board that Beck is offering a paltry settlement towards the repair of this destruction that won't begin to cover the cost for dredging our two ponds and the collateral damage. We were told last fall that COs would not be issued on this project until the problem was fixed and damages repairs. That did not happen. We were then told that there was a multi-million dollar bond that could be used towards the repairs. This has yet to happen. We have heard that at least at the last two city council meetings that the city is looking into ways to possibly help fund or facilitate repairs of this failed stormwater system that our other Trevi Club residents have experienced on Indian Creek on the east side of town. This gives us all hope. I am here to ask that you all will do the same for the citizens of Hogan Glen to research funds, earmark monies from the bond, or anything else that can help us in our efforts to get Beck to clean up and repair what this project has done to our neighborhood. I woke up this morning with a memory that I had forgotten about. We have fished in this pond from our backyard with our grandkids for years. We received from a tip that if we used hot dogs as bait, we would have better luck. It worked and we were catching fish about as fast as we could throw a line in, but we have not had that much luck at all this year. Last spring when we were fishing with our six-year-old grandson and having no luck at all, he said, Grammy, maybe they don't want like it here. They don't like it here because there isn't enough room for them to swim and play with all this mud. Out of the mouths of babes speaks truth. Please help all of the homeowners in Hogan's Glen to restore this property back to the premier neighborhood it once was. And I thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you, Kathy. Can Did I anybody talk? else wish to speak? I don't have another form signed up. But. All right, don't see anyone wishing to do so. We will then move on. 
We are to uh, announcements, proclamations, and reports on item number one. And council, I'm going to change the order slightly so that our business spotlight people don't have to stay unless they want to for the presentations. So this item is received town manager Norwood's update and provide input regarding the following. Uh, voter approved tax increase, uh, and Dr. Warren will be talking about that. Metroport Chamber of Commerce, and Sally Aldridge will be talking about that. Oh, I see Sally back there. Um, implicit biased training for the Trophy Club police officers, 12th Annual Pet Fest and Community Night, and then our business spotlight from Popcorn Central. Uh, if uh, Brandon and Kaylin would like to come forward, you can remove your mask and talk to us and tell us about your business. Well, good evening. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation to participate in the, uh, the business spotlight. It's a uh, great opportunity. Uh, so we're Brandon and Kaylin Wiltshire. We're the owners and operators of Popcorn Central, obviously. Uh, we've been in Trophy Club for 10 years now, um, have three kids. We've been open up for uh, just under a year now. We opened up October, I think, 14th or 15th. Um, those of you that don't know where we're located, we're located across the street from Byron Nelson High School, right next to Cook Children's Pediatrics. We have about 2,000 square feet where we pop uh, about 40-something flavors of gourmet popcorn, everything from dill pickle to jalapeno cheddar to cheesy ranch, uh, and of course, all the, all the popular flavors as well. So uh, we also carry about 100 different types of candy, and, uh, and we make fudge as well. Um, we'll be at Pet Fest. We'll be at the community event uh, coming up in a couple weeks, and we're gearing up for, a, hopefully, a very busy holiday season. So it's great to see some familiar faces, those of you that have has stopped by and showed your support. Thank you. Uh, as small business owners, COVID has kind of hit us right, right in the mouth, but uh, we're in survival mode, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to say that we're, we're, doing, we're doing okay. We're hanging in there, and uh, I think we're gonna be okay. Uh, so we're, uh, we're excited to be here, and uh, would love to uh, obviously have a strong holiday season. So uh, the only other thing I wanted to announce is that we do, uh, we do offer fundraisers. Now we can help with fundraisers for schools, for sports teams, and uh, the different organizations looking to raise money we have a special program set up to uh, support those different events and uh, those different programs. Oh, we do custom labels for uh, other businesses to help with your marketing needs in terms of uh, just, we can put your logo and branding on any of our products. Uh, we work with a lot of local businesses in, in that manner. And uh, we also, Kayla and I are the uh, owners of the local franchise for Card My Yard. So you'll see us up and about at crazy hours of the night in the evening, putting out stakes and signs in people's yards. So uh, we're, we're out, out and about quite a bit, so. Is there anything else? I think that's it. We brought some samples. Yeah, so we'll, we'll leave some samples on the, on the back, back table. table. So if anyone wants to grab any. Plenty of goodies. So thank you so much right. for uh, the opportunity. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Council, do you have any questions? <laughs> None? Okay. Right. Thank you very much thank you. for coming. Wish you the best. All right. Um, next item would be uh, voter approval tax increase, uh, VATR. A presentation by Dr. Ryder Warren of Northwest Independent School District. Dr. Warren, the floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody in person. It, it, this has really been good. We've uh, we've started meeting as a school board in person again, and it's been really been positive. So thank you for allowing me to come over. Um, uh, I like doing this every you know COVID or no COVID. I love coming and uh, giving you our our beginning of the school year report to you to see how how we're doing, how the kids are doing, and everybody's doing really well. We. Uh, we are in our second full week now of in-person learning. We've been in about our fourth or fifth week of, of learning, but uh, we've got about 19,000 kids in our schools again, and that's really good to see everybody. So I've got a presentation for you. It's in your packet, and uh, I'm not going to go over everything. I know I know you got a busy agenda, so I'm just going to go over the highlights, and then I will shut up and take any of your questions that, that you have of me. Uh, and again, I just appreciate the opportunity. Uh, that's what we're looking at right now. So we're about a 75%, 25%. 75% um, for us is about 19,300 kids, and that's that's uh, those are in our 30 campuses right now and about we, we've got about 6,500 in uh, remote learning um, the uh, 
the, uh, the kids and, and the staff are doing fantastic. You know, we, we still don't have our remote learning model down exactly the way I'd like it, uh, just because it's new and, and we're still trying to figure out the best way to serve the kids who have chosen and the families who have chosen in, uh, excuse me, remote learning. So we're gonna continue to look at that and just to try to make that just as good as they can be, especially those kids who are gonna be in it the whole school year, you know, for whatever reasons, whether they're med medically fragile or they have medically fragile parents or grandparents or whoever they live with, we're just going to make sure that we can serve them as best that we can. So any, if, uh, if, uh, if you have any uh, question or anything like that, we have a great website set up about our uh, return to learn programs, all the things that we're doing right now. Um, this is a website that a lot of our parents are, are going to almost every, every day. This is, this is actually uh, updated every day just to show uh, where we are on the, uh, the challenge of COVID. And we're tracking it by campus, we're tracking it as a district, and we're actually doing those numbers per campus so that parents can actually log on to that and see, uh, and see uh, where the, uh, where the uh, active cases are, the recovered cases. So that's, uh, so you know, with a, a school district of 25,000 kids and you know, 3,000 staff members, uh, 16,000 or 16, uh, 16 uh, active cases right now. And uh, I've been very pleased with the way the teachers, uh, all 30 campuses are handling our safety protocols. So that, that's been very good. Parents are getting three different letters, have the potential of getting three specific letters from us if an active case is found on a campus. Uh, everybody gets tier one. If, if, if a, a student or a staff member has COVID, everybody gets a letter. Tier two means they may have been in the same classroom. They might have been on the same team. Tier three, they sit right beside each other, and those are the kids that we're looking at having to quarantine things like that. So we're just being as we're being as uh, as uh, uh, open as possible uh, to make sure that everybody understands, you know, this challenge and 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 keeping kids safe, keeping staff safe. So construction is going very well. If you've driven by Byron Nelson, if you've driven around Byron Nelson, the new wing is fantastic, guys. Uh, I won't invite you in. Um, I, you guys are about my third uh, city council to have the beginning of the school year talk to. And I'm, I'm trying to get as many folks in the buildings again, getting them comfortable even in the buildings. Um, when you have a chance and uh, you can do a grab and go next month, you can actually do a sit down lunch. But the new wing for Byron Nelson, we actually created a new bistro. Uh, if you remember, if you've been up to the bistro, it was always second floor. You had to go up the stairs and everything like that. Well, now we have a, like kind of a restaurant front to the thing. So um, here's a, here's a, here's a, I'm, I'm giving this to all of, of our district leaders. All 14 city councils are going to get a, a chance to go in and have lunch on us. And we'd love for you to do that. Uh, Chief Arata said he'd take care of this for you. I didn't give these to him. So uh, uh, <laughs> those are, but there's enough for you right there. So uh, you're, you're my guest to come over to uh, to uh, have lunch on us. If you want to wait till about, probably about the second week of November, uh, you can go do a sit down lunch and the kids will be great to, to have you come in there. Um, Medlin's going very well. We're, we're, we're uh, creating a new fine arts edition uh, just because we have so many kids in the fine arts program, which is fantastic. And, and so that's going very well. Um, Okay, here's the, here's the gist of the talk, and, and I, I want to make sure that uh, you have time for any questions on this. We've got v three very important elections coming up in November. Uh, we usually don't have that many uh, uh, elections in November, but we have two that have been postponed. Uh, we have, the, of course, the, the yearly Board of Trustee elections. Those are usually in May. With the governor's order, we postpone those. So we've got, uh, we've got three up for a re-election in November. Then we have our bond election. Guys, we started working with our long range planning committee, which there's, there were several of your citizens, of Trophy Club uh, citizens on our long range planning committee. They've always been a part of our long range planning committee. They started working this time last year for our next bond. You know, we, we average about a bond every three or four years just to, to deal with our growth. Um, planning for a May election. And we had called the May election. And then of course, with the governor's uh, uh, edict, uh, we had to postpone that, so the next the, the next time we can do this is now November, and then we have a new election that we've had to call, and I'll give you that information about the voter approval tax rate election. The board has approved a tax rate that now the citizens of our the voters of our school district has to approve for us to keep that, and I'll I'll take you through the whys of that. So the bond and the VATRE, the voter approval tax rate election, is what we've got. The reason reason being that's where we are right now. Uh, Many of you have been in Northwest since 2010. You know, we, we had 10,000 less kids then. 
and we're still growing the 20, 20, 21 school year. We're going to have north of 26,000 kids, and we are quickly approving. You know, uh, most, hopefully most of us are going to be here in the next 10 years, and we could have close to 40,000 kids. Um, that's the outline of our district, 234 square miles of it, and all those weird little uh, green uh, shapes. That's where there's guys on the ground right now turning dirt, building new homes, or they're about to. Those are, those are more than 80 new uh, home sites, home uh, subdivisions going in right now. That's what uh, my uh, facility guys are tracking right now. So uh, those are all either, again, in progress or being planned. And that's, uh, that's kind of what we look at as, a, as every 10 year challenge. Uh, 1,100 kids every, uh, every year, new kids. Uh, about over 6,000 over five years and over 13,000 and that has been consistent guys COVID has not slowed that down one bit we still have kids checking in every day um, so that's that's still the challenge so the bond that we were going to have in May that now has been postponed until uh, until uh, November is a 986.6 million dollar bond um, one of the best news that we got because of our values because we you know we have so much growth in the district this can actually be funded if the voters give us a thumbs up on this this can actually be funded without a tax rate increase so, you know the district has two different tax rates maintenance and operation our MO tax rate uh, is the big one that's the one that funds day-to-day -day operations it mostly funds people it, it, it pays for salaries and benefits for our staff the INS rate, the interest and sinking rate, is the one that we pay for our bonded indebtedness. And so um, that is the one that always is affected, most of the time is affected by a successful bond. But again, because of our value growth, uh, this is not going to affect the tax rate one bit. So that, that's a very positive thing for us, and, and hopefully it'll be a positive thing in the, the eyes of, of our voters. But that is, uh, that is the, uh, the thing that we are looking forward to, to, to really getting in front of the information in front of our voters as, as we do this. Um, those are the five areas that our long-range planning committee always, you know, this is, this is how we organize our bond. You know, uh, they, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, the vast majority of that 986 you can see is just for growth, for, for students who are going to come into the district who, who, that we need space for, and then renovations and improvements of our existing buildings, technology, safety, and then our program. So that's how we have broken it up. That's how our committee, our district committee, has broken that up. And then you can get, and, and then the website down at the bottom, if you really want to dig into what we're doing, that's a great website that we've st stood up to show you everything that we've been doing. So the seven new schools that we need, the future schools, transportation, additions, renovations, all those things, and um, uh, the, the work at Northwest. And I gave you, um, you know, the replacement school at Pike, replacement schools for Hatfield Elementary and Seven Hills Elementary. Um, and, and guys, I mean, those of you who know me, I do a really good job griping about the legislature. I'm, I'm kind of gifted at it. But one of the things, one of the best things they did last legislative session of, ni of uh, 19, um, Texas is now required, all Texas school districts right now is required to have full day pre-K programs. And, and guys, for those families who truly, who qualify for pre-K services, it it's so makes a difference in their lives. If we can get those four-year-olds in and get them academically minded and do that, um, you know, we actually assess children being kindergarten ready. And it has really affected our kindergarten readiness being able to have, especially those full day pre-K. So those schools, which Lakeview is a part of, uh, Beck already has them. We, we actually added uh, schools at Beck a couple of bonds ago, but Lakeview is gonna be one of those ones that, and Roanoke's gonna be one of those ones that we add room for full day pre-Ks. All right, and so again, just going through those different, um, those different categories, the technology that we're gonna have, the safety and security, just making sure we have the safest possible environment for our kids and our staff student programs, all the way from career technology, special ed, fine arts, and athletics. And then I gave you specifically just a, to, to, to a trophy club, you know, there's what the, this bond, if, if the bond is successful, this is what Beck will get, all those categories, Lakeview, and you can roll through this and, and take time to do that. Um, Medlin, Tidwell, that serves, that serves uh, Byron Nelson, and then Byron Nelson itself. So every, there would not be one campus in the district that would not be affected by this bond again if approved so all 30 would get something mostly in those categories all right so that's how that's how uh it has been organized by our uh, by our committee now um 
this is the way it is organized by the state and I wanted to make a differentiation this last legislative session let me go back to griping about the legislature um, you know the board usually and when we call bonds we have the decision making power of, of how many propositions we want to set them up into to do that we don't have that ability anymore the the legislature is now mandating the propositions and so school districts in the state of Texas we all have to adhere to these four different propositions a prop a prop b prop c prop d and it just depends on what you do within it the majority of the stuff is going to go prop a but if you do any work to any recreational facilities if the bond is approved medlin is going to get new tennis courts if if it is approved so we have to pay that part we have to put that part in prop b prop c uh, if we need to work on the stadiums um, prop d I have no idea with as, with as important as technology is to the education of kids right now, I have no idea why the legislature broke technology out, the devices out, but they did. So we'll have four different propositions on your ballot on that. And then House Bill 3 also requires to make sure we put down on, on the end of every ballot that this is a property tax increase. So what I'm, what I'm having to be very careful about when I'm talking to our community members about this is, you just heard me say this was not gonna affect the tax rate, but it is going to extend our debt. We're going to put on more debt. It won't affect the tax rate. And just and I'm the 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 the, the example I'm giving is you know if you're paying off a car, you can go buy a new car and buy it for the same amount that you're paying a month, but you're extending your debt. Same thing we're doing here. We're not going to be we're not going to have to affect the tax rate on this, but we will extend our debt because we're going to we're going to add more debt to uh, to what we have already. So those are the four propositions that we will have on the bond. And there's that little disclaimer that the, the legislature has put on us to do that. Okay, and, and, and that just kind of gives you the amount of money for each proposition. And like I said, the vast majority of it is Prop A for school facilities and capital improvements. Okay, and that just gives you the actual projects in, associated with that. So the last thing, guys, uh, the voter approval tax rate election, this will be Proposition E. This will be the fifth proposition on the November ballot. Um, here's the, the a, a voter approval tax rate election um, is mandated by the state if a school board exceeds the tax rate House Bill 3 has mandated for us and we and we've done that reason being guys I came to you a couple of years ago talking about the legislation legislative session coming up and that we needed a lot of help from the legislature because the the school finance system was so antiquated they created a new finance system in the, the spring of 2019 um, we, we're, we're, we're losers in that. Northwest ISD, along with a, a, quite a few other school districts, are not uh, uh, going to make out very well at all under the new system. And I've already started talking to our five state representatives and our three state senators, but we're going to need a lot of help from them because it is just not generating the, the, the revenue that we had even under the old system. We are losing 10 to $15 million per year from our operating budget, our operating revenue uh, to do that. And that's a huge hit for us. So that's the reason why we're having to ask permission to set a particular tax rate. If we are able to do this, uh, the state gives us 13 extra pennies that we can access to do this so that we would be able to bring in about $21 million, which, which would do two things for us. It would not only um, negate the money that we're losing from the new finance system, it would also prop us up for the growth we have because guys, my our budget never stays the same. Our expenditures never stay the same. Because of our growth, we are always adding to our expenditures just to keep up with the number of kids coming in. So that would not only, that would not only, if approved, give us enough money to uh, to uh, take care of what we're being reduced but also plan for growth in the future so what we're doing is we're going to ask permission of our electorate for the tax rate and we're, we've got to get into our budget and we've got to uh, look at every program and make sure every program is uh, as efficiently run as possible and if it's not something that we think is going to add to our uh, our mission or our, our, our uh, uh, vision statements uh, that we're probably we're gonna have to cut it out because again we have to make sure that we have enough funds moving forward just to plan for the, gr the growth that we know is going to be coming in um, we actually, the school board, were actually, if, we pay, if you paid attention to my letters at all last year, we were actually contemplating a TRE last year. Um, we came in with about a $20 million def dollar deficit budget uh, because of, of House Bill 3. We, we lost those funds, and we actually were going to plan a p TRE last year, but the last part of the legislati legislative session, 
they canceled, the legislature canceled all TREs for every school district in the state. So we, by law, we were unable to call one last year. Hence, this is why we have to call one this year. And November is the only month that you can call a VA TRE. A lot of people ask me, well, why are you doing it now? The state legislature only gives us November to do it. Um, so this year we came in with about a $25 million deficit budget and now we're, we've called the VR, VA TRE. Uh, that's just the difference in what we have. You know, we, we're about the, that, there's the $25 million deficit for this, the, for this budget cycle. If we get the extra revenue, then we're, we essentially, we've balanced our budget uh, going forward. Uh, we, can, we can make up that $4 million. We just can't make up the $25 million. So that's going to be on the ballot. Um, what we are looking at for, we're looking at about four and a half more cents than what we paid last year. That is what we're asking permission to do. So we were at $1.42 last year. If you add up the M&O and the INS, and we're asking for about $1.46, 6.3, uh, so a little over 4.63 .4 cents uh, than we had last year. Now, I told you we can access 13 pennies. Here's where those 13 pennies come in. Part of the reason why we're losing so much revenue is a House Bill 3 is mandating we lower our M&O tax rate. The board does not set, the last two years, our school board has not set the tax rate. The state has. They are mandating that we lower it. That's how we've lost a lot of our revenue. So, to, so we were going to be compressed again to 91 cents, and the board set it at $1.04. That's where those 13 cents, so we, so we go from what would have been $1.33 to the $1.46. That's the 13 pennies that we are asking permission to access. All right, and this one is that I'm just trying to make sure people understand we're not asking for anything above and beyond what we have normally done. Uh, in fact, we're actually even lower than we have been in 17, 18 and 18, 19, but um, it is an increase from what we were last year. So uh, I just wanna make sure people understand we, uh, we are not going into this um, with, uh, with closed eyes. We, we, this is not a great time to ask for a tax rate increase. We understand that. But it's just for it just for to make sure that we are, are financially viable for not only this school year but for the school years to come, and, and uh, that's the reason why the board really really needed to access those 13 pennies. So uh, I know no one uh, in the room is in this age group, but if you know anybody 65 or older, um, of course that won't affect uh, the the passage of this. Will, will not affect uh, uh, homeowners uh, 65 unless they've done something really substantially different to their homes, if they've added on to their homes or anything like that. And then we're uh, we're just pushing people to vote. Um, we've got a great uh, we've got a great uh, website set up on that, and uh, we're we're looking forward to having a lot of conversations about this. So a lot of challenges. First and foremost is we're just we're just really pleased to have our kids back. We really are. That was that was tough on teachers, tough on families, just not having kids back. So we're very proud to have that. We're going to have a great school year. Just like I said, we got we got COVID challenge and and this the the bond and the uh, T V A T R E on top of that. It's, it's just the weird world that we live in, but uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a great, great school year, and we, appreciate, we really do appreciate your leadership, appreciate your support. So what, what questions can I answer for you, if any? So my, my question is, uh, of the interest in sinking rate that you showed us, Yep. Uh, that's if the bond gets approved, is that right? The interest in sinking rate, Nick, if it is approved, it's going to be 42 cents. Okay, right. It was, and that, that actually, and I, and, I, and I breezed through this, if you look at this, we actually lowered that part. Again, our values being the way they are, we actually were able to lower that three pennies because we knew we were going to have to ask our electorate for more pennies on the M&O side. So we didn't want to take a big, and, and, and we can make our debt payments, even lowering it three cents, we can actually add that 986, if approved, to it without the penny increases. So where I was headed was, what's the forecast for the next five years for interest in sinking? Um, it will remain there. If, if this bond is passed and we don't pass another one for another five years, that it would stick at 42 or start rolling down as our tax, our INS, as we pay down the debt. And the board, the board has done a great job in the past of uh, refinancing and, and trying to pay off bonds early. You know, we, we finance bonds for 25 to 30 years, uh, but we are only right now paying on bonds uh, from 2008. So we're only paying 12 years now of bonds that, and but we've had bonds since 1996. So we've paid all that off early to be able to, uh, to do what we do. So that's, that's always important to them. All right, thank you. Michael? I guess, can you help me uh, 
Thanks for coming, by the way. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, the the Robinhood plan, I think it's a dated term now, but how does the potential tax increase yeah. affect with the I mean, Robinhood plan? And thank you reason, for thank you for asking, Michael. Yeah, and just just to um, to kind of get set the, a little bit of the scenario here, having family from small towns and out in other areas that are don't have the revenue we have. Yeah. I've seen some of that money not used as wisely. That <laughs> yeah, and I'll we, leave it at that. Robin Hood actually is not an antiquated term. It's still a, okay. a term that we use. Um, and that's that's the problem that I have with HB3. Um, we were told all legislative session that Northwest ISD was actually going to be out of Robin Hood. We call it recapture. The, the state is recapturing funds that we have and taking them back to the state to distribute to other districts. We were actually told that we were going to be out of Robin Hood at least for this biennium we, we've never been we've paid four million dollars last year and we have budgeted about seven and a half to leave us this year uh, and michael if you'll look at this slide um, 13 pennies in nisd actually generates 33 million dollars for us we would only get to keep 21 of that yeah that that is what so so we are still paying for for the education and, and i don't michael i i don't uh, I don't have a really bad attitude about any school district getting more money. I just don't want to take a, uh, be taken from our kids and our, sta our, our taxpayers. You know, I, I want to keep that here and let us do that. You know, we, like I said, we if if we didn't have Robin Hood at all, if the, if the state even if the state would even didn't give us any state aid, if they would just give us our values and our tax rate. We could operate in ISD for a long, long time without as high of a tax rate to do that. If the state would just kind of leave us out of it, but they, they'll, that, that's not a, that's not, never an option. So, so we are still. It's called being a Chapter 49 school district. It used to be for the last 25 years as a Chapter 41. I'm talking about the the Education Code. Chapter 41 in Education Code was for pro, what they call property wealthy school districts. Now they changed that with this new law. They changed it to Chapter 49. So we are a Chapter 49 district. This uh, about um, March or uh, April of this school year, we will get our bill from the state, which we think again is going to be about seven and a half million dollars, and that's what we have to send back to comply with that law. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. You bet. Council, any other questions? No, I'll just say my wife is happy that you opened the school. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of that. <laughs> I'm sure there's well, a lot of parents that are. <laughs> well, guys, uh, again, uh, enjoy the bistro when you can. Uh, we, we're, we're just we're, we appreciate your leadership. We appreciate you stepping up and being leaders in your community. We really do. And if there's anything that you guys need, if there's anything the town needs, the only thing you have to do is call. We'll do everything that we can do to support you. Okay. We appreciate Thanks. that partnership that we've had for so many years working together, and appreciate your leadership uh, in our district. And uh, you're willing to come talk to us about the importance of this. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you, sir. Uh, the next item under this agenda is a presentation by Metroport Chamber of Commerce and Sally Aldridge is going to present. Sally, you're welcome to remove your mask if you wish to do so. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to come and and speak again. It's our annual report with the chamber. I know that Dr. Warren has just left, but I do want to commend him on his leadership throughout COVID. It has, uh, I have been very impressed with how our district has worked with to make sure our kids are continuously educated uh, throughout that. Uh, but um, I'm uh, later than usual. I usually come in uh, the early part of the summer, but as we've all been delayed, I'm here now. Uh, I have uh, lots to report and I'm gonna go through it really quick. We have not changed our mission, vision, or value statement. I always like to point that out in my presentation. Uh, as of December the 31st, because that was my end of year report, we had 551 members, uh, 185 new members, 15% growth and 76% retention. As of September the 1st, we uh, dropped to 542 with 69 new members, but we are definitely losing members uh, because of the pandemic. We we're doing all we can, but uh, we were expecting that. And across the board, chamber, chambers are, are experiencing that. This gives you uh, a snapshot of where all of our levels are. As you can see, most of our members fall in the basic and the business level. And we're thankful to the many partners, including our communities, that support us on high level amounts because that allows us to do the amount of things that we do for our business community. 
And this is a snapshot of where all of the businesses are coming from. And as you can see, we are still a good 50% coming from outside of our seven communities, uh, which shows you how many people and businesses want to do business in our area. These are some of our top member partners at both the chairman's level and the president's circle. A lot of uh, Fortune 100 and 500s. And here are our top event partners at the Platinum and Golds, as well as the Silvers and Bronze. Our officers uh, this year uh, are a wide range of both large and small businesses for our board, as well as our directors. And just to give you a snapshot of some of the things that we have focused on with the shutdown, our offices shut down the middle of March and we did not open up again until June. However, my team was working remotely. We did many uh, coronavirus, coronavirus communications to our members, uh, providing a lot of financial assistance and opportunities for them. We did virtual weekly meetings with our governmental and chamber related organizations to stay on top of everything. We partnered with the Denton and Tarrant County to promote business grants to the businesses in both counties. Uh, we created a web page for COVID-19. Uh, we had community nonprofit web page because they are their needs that they needed throughout this program, uh, throughout the shutdown. And we also offered member marketplace ads. And we did a member survey, which we also provided that to local and to state officials. And we also put in place an, a monthly payment plan to help the members stay involved. And this is just a snapshot of the promotional opportunities that we had to put out there for this. On virtual lockdown, we still communicated and held Zoom. I think everybody's gotten very used to the virtual platform, but um, we felt this was very necessary to keep people engaged and connected. So that's a, a snapshot of the things that we did. And that just gives you an overview of what people were looking like as we were talking to each other. So moving forward, uh, we have opened up our events. We started back in June. Uh, we, uh, we had slowly been opening up our larger events. August was our first membership luncheon, uh, but we have worked very diligently with our venues to make sure that we are continually to, remaining safe and, and providing the programs for our members. And how have we worked with our communities? On our ED initiatives, we've continued with our strategic plan. In your packet today, you see an economic uh, development brochure, which we handed out at the uh, Alliance Development Forum. Uh, we did our annual business referral guide, which is also in your uh, packet. Uh, we've held off on the regional video because we were supposed to film that this spring. So we'll hold that off till next spring. We've created a new website that's much more user friendly and links to all of our seven communities. And we continue to have a monthly meeting still virtual with our seven communities and stay in touch. And we did do a booth for NetCar last fall, but we've held off this year and all the communities are gonna wait until next year. And we're thankful we were able to get the Alliance Development Forum in. It was our ninth annual. Uh, we, it was the last event the week before everything shut down. We had over 430 attending. This is the event we partner with our seven communities. We fe featured the Alliance Texas Mobility Zone uh, and uh, the president of Hillwood, Mike Berry, was our main speaker. And of course, we, uh, we highlighted our seven communities. Our membership luncheons pre-COVID, we averaged 300. Right now we're averaging 130, but the numbers are going up. We actually have about 160 reservations for our upcoming luncheon, so that's getting better. Um, we do always do annual communication, community recognition uh, and our State of the Communities Address we did in 2019, but again, because we could not do our April luncheon, we had to hold off for next year. So we are not building several campuses like the school district, but we are very excited about our new building. Uh, we will be moving in on October the 9th. It's located at 381 West Byron Nelson Boulevard. This is an 8,000 square foot building that will house not only the chamber team, but also will offer co-working opportunities and seven leasable offices. Uh, for people to start as incubator businesses. Our goal is to help businesses grow and be able to move out of this space and into hopefully our seven communities into larger space. And that's the information I just shared. Our goal is to raise 600,000 for this project. And um, we had to of course hold off on our capital campaign this year. So we're gonna reignite it uh, at the end of this year. Uh, these are all the opportunities to be able to be on our legacy wall. 
And then we're also doing a heritage wall on the second floor for those who would like to purchase what we're calling a brick, but it's going on, it's gonna be a, a wood, wood brick that will go on the wall on the heritage. And then we're also uh, asking our members to participate in what we call the 110% club and giving 10% more of their membership. We've raised over 300,000 so far in in-kind and cash contributions. And these are the building partners. If it wasn't for this group on this, on this slide, this, this project would not have been possible. It's definitely teamwork that's brought this together. So far, these are our cash investors. And this is just a slide of some of the things that we did pre-COVID uh, pre uh, when we had to shut down. Uh, but I wanna thank the Town of Trophy Club for your tremendous partnership over the years and, uh, and absolutely can answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I had a question. Um, you mentioned business grants, and I just wondered if you're able to tell us any businesses in Trophy Club that maybe applied and got a grant. I have not seen the latest list on that, but I could absolutely do some follow-up and get back to you. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Carl? I wanted to ask you about the leadership program. Is that, yes. is that going on? And it is, it is going on. In fact, we had to uh, make changes this year with our program. Uh, a lot of the chambers still graduated everybody in the spring, but weren't able to finish. So we changed the program and our class this year has been the longest. They started last September and they're actually gonna graduate this December. So we've been able to get the final classes in in September, um, October and November. So you will see the graduating class this December. Uh, I, you should put a plug in for the next class. So uh, we are going to, yes, so we're going to possibly have to make some changes and delay. That's why I did not mention it this evening. But it, we will we'll continue it, it but watch for it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Anybody else, con okay. council, anybody else have questions? Sally, I know we've been trying to get you in uh, to, to talk. And uh, Trophy Club is a little bit behind the curve, so to speak, in getting involved in your fundraising program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have talked to Steve in the past about trying to look at how we can do this Great. Uh, in some fashion. And so council, that'll be coming back to you to talk about it in more detail uh, as to do you want to participate at some level uh, in this capital program. That'd be wonderful. So we really have a great leadership team there at uh, the chamber, very responsive. Uh, this is an aggressive step for our young chamber. It is. Relatively young but really innovative in the sense of offices that people could rent and uh, shared space. So uh, maybe that will help everything that you're doing. Yeah, we're really hoping it will because it's very expensive to lease space for companies that are wanting to get started. And we just felt that this was a great opportunity that I think it really fits well with our mission and what a Chamber of Commerce should do is to help businesses stay in the region, grow, and our goal is to, to work with our communities and encourage them to stay as they, as they grow. Thank you, Sally. You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sanders, I wanna thank you for your leadership over the years too, because I know that you are finishing your term, so I appreciate your friendship with the Chamber, so thank, thank you. you. I'll have to join as my business again, so an individual. All right, uh, the next item still under this uh, reports and proclamations is uh, implicit bias training for Trophy Club police officers. Uh, Chief, are you gonna talk to us about that? Yes, sir. Mayor, Council, um, first of all, I wanna thank you for your support for the police department. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Town Manager Norwood for his support. This is definitely a trying time for police departments in the country, uh, what we're going through. But, but it's also made us step back and look at ourselves and look at our, our departments and see where we are and where we're going in the future. So what we've done <clears throat> is uh, we work with Dr. Alex Del Carmen. I think you recognize that name. He's been on staff or contract with us for the last several years to do our racial profiling report every year. Well, he is the leading expert in police racial profiling in the country. The Department of Justice hires him, other police departments hire him to, to go in and look at stuff. Well, we have him on contract to help us. So we've asked him to, to, to help us look for the, towards the future of policing in the United States and what can we do to, to better ourselves. So he's actually put together a class on bias-based policing and he's already taught all of our police officers that class. So we went through that a couple, about a week and a half ago. And um, <clears throat> basically it, what it did was 
he started off from an academic level on what biases are, implicit and implied biases, and, and how we get them, and how we develop ourselves, and, and then how that relates to police work and what we've been doing as, as policemen and relating to the public. So the officers got to understand themselves and, and how we're gonna look towards the future in policing. So, and, and Dr. Del Carmen also worked with us on other issues, but let me, let me back up to the racial profiling report. What we get from him is the state requires that we do an annual report on racial profiling, and in that report, it looks at our, our department at a, um, a micro level of how we do all of our vehicle stops and searches and all that stuff. What Dr. Del Carmen does, it takes it to the micro level and actually looks at individual police officers and how they're doing in terms of racial profiling when they're encountering people and talking to people on the street. And our program really does shine to where our police officers are doing the right thing almost all the time. That's when he's been able to show us. So that, that in itself is a, is a really good knowledge for our, our leadership staff to understand how our young men and women are doing when it comes to racial profiling. And we're building on that. And what we've encouraged throughout this program was, you know, we looked at the way we were leading these young men and women and realized we're actually doing a fairly decent job of leading from the bottom. We encourage these young men and women to be, you know, we hired them to be as good people and we're making them really good policemen. And so what we've done is we're building up leaders from the bottom. So they have the ability to, to stop me or anybody else from doing something wrong. And that's what we've already started. And I think you, you guys already know that. Um, as you see some of the things that we've been doing and posting on social media and stuff. So, um, but that's what we've done. We're trying to, to get ahead of the curve and stay ahead of where things are going and be a leader in, in the law enforcement community in this environment. And with Dr. Del Carmen's help and Mr. Norwood's help, we've, we've been doing some outside training and, and like the bias-based police training and other things to make our young men and women the best policemen they can be for our community. So. Thank you, sir. Council, any questions? And, and before, if you have some questions, I just want to publicly uh, compliment Chief Arada on this because this is not required yet. Uh, and this is, you know, this is putting yourself out there in your department and not many agencies in the country are doing this. They're either getting pressured into doing it or they're being mandated for some reason to do it. And we're, we're taking the initiative to have somebody from the outsider that is a nationally recognized expert come in and review our policies, our procedures. And I think it's a, I think it's very, um, maybe creative is not the right word, but it's taking an open and honest look at yourself. And, and again, we, we have some great officers here, but I do compliment Chief Arada and the leadership team for doing this, because if some things come back that we need to improve on, that's great, that's what we want. Uh, so this is a great first step, and, uh, and I think as it moves forward, I think that brings in a much higher quality of uh, men and women to the police department. So, great job. Thank you, thank you. Michael? I guess first, uh, kind of like what the town manager said, just want to echo that, and I just want to thank you publicly, just the discussions we've had, because it's not easy being a cop today. Yes, sir. It, it, and uh, just, you know, one little video clip, <clears throat> next thing you know, it's gone viral. And so I just appreciate the discussions, appreciate partnering with you, and appreciate just the discussions you've had in that. Uh, kind of going over this training we have here with, with Dr. Carmen here, just, I was just curious, um, and I respect and appreciate you taking initiative to jump out there and get ahead of this curve. But um, do we have reoccurring training planned or is that coming up for a, the January discussion kind of going forward? Yes, and I'd like to tell Manager Norwood, he's actually helping us review our, poly, our training folders mm -hmm. and see what our officers are being trained in and what we can look forward to to training them to increase that uh, ability in the future. But yes, we are, this is a continuing thing and it's, we're building on it. Awesome, yep. thank, thank you. Sir. Appreciate it. Hello. Yeah, no, I, I want to say thanks to you. Know, I think everybody knows my position because I always say it during budget time, training, 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 training. You know, we can't have enough training because uh, obviously our, our officers don't face, man, I sit at home at night and watch what's going on in Portland. I'm just shocked, you know, that that's happening in America. But, you know, but it, it I've always said it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I'd much rather spend the money that, uh, you know, and I'm always asking, can, is there more? Do you need more training? Yes, we, you know, 
because I just think that uh, you, you can't have enough. You know, you you, you, you military guys know that it's, when the SEALs go in, they don't just one week decide, okay, we're going to go knock. They train, 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 train. That's for, after they evaluate the movie deals. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I mean, the, it, it, the more train and, and the more that we can do things like this where, you know, uh, look at our department and see if there's you know things that can be improved. I'm all for it. So I appreciate the leadership. That's right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Questions? Chief, thank you very much. Uh, thank appreciate you. that report. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Chief. Steve, are you going to present uh, the other two? Or are we? Yes. Tony. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just a reminder as we get into October uh, next month, that's pretty active as far as a couple of our really popular events for the community. October 3rd at uh, Freedom Dog Park will be Pet Fest, and I think we average anywhere from three to 400 people that show up for that. So that'll be 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, there'll be plenty of vendors and um, photo booth and raffles and things like that. So it uh, should be, again, very well attended. And then October 10th, uh, that evening will be our community night. Um, and In-N-Out Burger is gonna be out there providing meals. Um, and that's 6 to 9 p.m. And there's going to be a movie this year, but I think you will need to register in order to, uh, to gain access. So please check our website uh, as it gets closer so you can make sure if you're interested in attending that movie that uh, we get you uh, the time and the effort to get you a pass. So, uh, so again, those are both very well attended, very popular events. And Parks and Rec is doing great job in, uh, in keeping these things moving with the challenges that we've been talking about tonight so that's all thank you Steve council any questions about those all right seeing no one seeking the floor we'll move on to item two take appropriate action issuing proclamation 2020-10 recognizing October 4th <clears throat> 2020 as the Patriot Tour Day and Trophy Club Whereas the Patriot Tour is a national nonprofit organization consisting of firefighters, police, officers, and leaders in the community whose sole purpose is to provide communities with a program that locally supports veterans, law enforcement, and fire service personnel. And whereas October 4th, 2020 will be recognized as the Patriot Tour Day to, uh, to appreciate and be thankful for veterans and public safety professionals throughout the community. And in doing so, we'll request the community wear patriotic colors in honor of America and to join forces to help the Patriot Tour movement. Whereas the Patriot Tour has evolved to appreciate all Americans by expressing appreciation and thankfulness to all the veterans, current military, law enforcement, and fire service personnel by brightening their day with a simple smile to all who have served and are serving for our freedom. And whereas there shall be no limitation to what, a possible, what is possible within our community devoted to the Patriot Tour, where said efforts could be celebrated every day, but specifically on the Patriot Tour Day. And whereas the Patriot Tour Day is a day dedicated to recognize all Americans, veterans, law enforcement, and fire service personnel Today, the needs exist to come together and teach future generations of our country's freedom as one nation for the love of humanity and not in service to oneself. Now, therefore, I see Nick Sanders, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the Town of Trophy Club, to here proclaim October 4th, 2020, as the Patriot Tour Day and Trophy Club. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve this. So moved. Munger approved. Do I have a second? Second. Grassi uh, seconded. All in favor, show your hands. It is unanimous. Can I say something real quick? You may. Uh, don't be surprised if there's lots of siren activity that day because there's a couple of fire trucks, I think, maybe some police cars that are going to visit some shut in veterans. So there may be a little activity around town. Great. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, I didn't plan to say something tonight about this topic because it's a proclamation and wanted to let it go through and not take a lot of time, but 
I feel like I need to address something, and I'm not sure if Chief Arata is out there as well, but um, there's some things I saw on Facebook that I found really disturbing here lately, and it's it's relevant to, to Patriot Tour Day. And I saw somebody, there was a video of young kids taking down American flags, spray painting them with certain things, taking up campaign signs, and that's very concerning to me as somebody who's a September 11th veteran. We've, we've gone a long way, and I just wanted to, to voice my support for, for first responders, for police and veterans, and this, this event, even though I'm not going to be able to make it because of family commitment. But just to kind of show how far we've come, we're grandstanding against the people that protect us. And when I was with the Fortune 500 company, before I left for, for military service after September 11th, that company went out and bought each of us a little American flag and put it on everybody's desk. And that's the same flag from 19 years ago. I've kept it on my desk every day, wherever I've gone, promotions, cha job changes, whatever. And this is one of the things that we, we do a lot of proclamations and they're all special, but this is one of the ones that like, I felt like I wanted to say something because I can't believe in my lifetime I'm having to explain 19 years later why I joined the military and how we've, we, we the, on September 12th, everybody was holding doors open for each other. Everybody was thanking each other at their grocery store and going out of their way to take care of folks. And, uh, but I can relate to our police officers and our firefighters right now because we had to start taping our missions to keep from being court-martialed when we were engaged by the enemy. And it's not a nice place to be when you're trying to defend your life to let somebody else vote and your friends are dying to give somebody else the right to vote. And that's why I wanted to bring this up during this time of the year because I just want to challenge people out there that are exercising their First Amendment rights. There are men and women that lay their life down every day to die to give them that right. Don't throw away and don't take for granted your Bill of Rights on just one thing or just to express something because you disagree with it. And a lot of those people out there that are doing this, I'm assuming, are probably not old enough to remember the unity that happened when I got this flag, but I do. And I just want to tell everybody there, thank you. Thank you for your team for helping put this together. Carl, I know you had some stuff to help pull this together, and I just want to tell you all thank you. And um, just I'm just asking people as a veteran that lost friends overseas in combat and in harm's way, and my brother died a very slow painful death from cancer when he got from the burn pits. Don't take this lightly. Don't take our this season lightly. That's all. I, I'll just stop there. Thank you, Michael. Jay, would you like to tell us a little bit more about uh, the day and what's happening? Since though we have October 3rd is Pet Fest and October 10th is Community Night, October 4th is... It's Patriot. the Patriot Day Tour coming through Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, Trophy Club's going to be the stop in Dallas Fort Worth it'll it'll begin on October 1st in Phoenix Arizona it'll come to the San Antonio area and progress this way they're going to hit 35 cities in 28 days their plan is to be in Washington DC on November 3rd and 4th and culminate that tour and it is it's just a it's just a tour to thank everyone that helps exercise our freedoms you know our, our military our law enforcement firefighters um, it just it throws support to that but the main thing about this is once they get into town we will. We will create a lot of noise. There'll be a lot of fire engines and police vehicles from around the surrounding communities that'll be involved in this coming into town with a lot of fanfare. Once we have our event at Trophy Club Country Club uh, that evening on the 4th, afterwards, they'll actually go out and split about. Carl and his team have been working on this and identifying non-ambulatory veterans around the community and surrounding communities that aren't going to be able to make uh, these events and so they're going to go out and reach a hand out go to their homes just to shake a hand or give them a hug and thank them I know that there's from what I understand there's at least one World War II veteran it's a hundred years old that will be visited and that's to me that's a walking encyclopedia and somebody that should be extremely cherished but all these people are are ones that have put their lives on the line for us for me to do what I do for all of us to exercise the freedoms we exercise every day and they and they deserve nothing more than us to come to their house and give them a handshake and a hug and tell them thank you. So um, that's really what it's all about, is just spreading that cheer and telling them thank you for their service across the country and culminating that on November uh, 2nd, 3rd. 
in December in DC, excuse me. Thank you, Chief. So let's get a picture. And Council, I'm going to ask you all to come down. If you have a mask, put it on. And I see Tony back there going to try to take a picture. So let's stand. That side of the podium and see if you can still get us all in. All right. Do we need to, are we okay? That's it? Yeah, smile. <laughs> your eyes will smile. Yes, smile to your Thank you. Chief, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate, appreciate that. It. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll take care of these lunch. Oh, I'm sure. Tickets for you. <laughs> and the pop. <laughs> And the popcorn. <laughs> if you've never tried Byron Bistro, you should try to do that. It's uh, they do a really excellent job. Food is good. Uh, it's really all the students that do everything, uh, so it's really a great program. And I'm glad that it's a little bit more convenient uh, with the construction. Um, we're down to the consent agenda. All matters listed on the con as consent agenda are considered to be routine by the town council and will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion of these items will be held. Only items removed from the consent agenda will be considered separately. Does anybody on council wish to remove any of the items three through five? <clears throat> See no one wishing to do so. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion Make to approve consent agenda items three, four, and five. Moved by Councilmember Bone, seconded by? I'll second. Karasi. All in favor, show your hands. It is unanimous. We're down to item six. Conduct a public hearing regarding the Public Improvement District ESD tax rate. Uh, Town Manager Norwood, oh, and Mike Irwin is here uh, to talk about it. It is, oops, it is 803. And we will enter the public hearing. Mike, you want to say something? Uh, just very quickly, this is the ESD tax rate, which is proposed at 0 0.06476, which is below last year's rate. This is the PIDS part of the fire service. And uh, I'll step away for the public hearing. All right. Thank you, Mike. Anybody in the audience wish to speak on the public hearing? Seeing no one wishing to speak, uh, then I will call upon Philip Schaffner. Were you going to do yeah. it after the public hearing? Uh, no, I just I, I can do it now. All right, um, public. Go ahead. This is just to be clear, because yes. I got a question over the weekend at a soccer game. Yes. From somebody who received a letter. And I had to explain to them that this is the exact same rate that I pay in the mud for fire tech for I mean I'm sorry uh, yeah for fire the exact same rate this is what we're doing to the pit yes correct? sir yes sir this the rate itself is not the same in fact the mud rate is a little bit higher than what the PID rate is. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> I looked it up as we we're preparing for this, for that question. But it's the exact same concept. Our citizens who are in the mud pay about 800000 toward fire service, and the citizens who are in the PID pay about 500000 for fire service, and that's what this tax rate generates. Okay. But in essence, everybody's paying the same percentage you might say based on the total dollar volume by the number of households right and their value yes. yeah now, so that's what I tried to explain to him that you know you're paying exactly proportional right. what I'm paying in the mud yes and then that led to oh, what is a pit and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a black hole rabbit yeah. hole you go down <laughs> so all right anybody else wish to speak or any other questions from yeah. council I just have one really clarification because we get this question every year in the, the couple years I've been on council 
but just to clarify, and I'm not really sure who, who we want to direct the question to, but just when it comes to the PID and it comes to this rate here, this is a part of somebody who lives in the PID. This is a part of the stack of papers that we sign when we buy a house in the PID that says that we're acknowledging that this is a rate that's going to be associated with what we talked about last time with the MUD and what we're all referencing here. This is a part of the documents somebody signs when they buy a house that lives in the PID district. Is that correct? Laddie would be the yes, who, it just, yeah, it, who just it, bought. But that, that's correct. That's all I want to be sure because we get questions on it all the time. Just yes. it, you signed it when you bought your house if you live in the PID. So, all right. Uh, seeing no one wishing to speak, it is uh, eight oh eight. We will close the public hearing. We are down to item seven. Take appropriate action regarding ordinance. 2020-16 for the adoption of the public improvement district's tax rate. Do I have someone wishing to move this ordinance? Make a motion to approve item seven. Do have a second? Uh, all right. And Carl Munger. Moved by Sean Bone, seconded by Carl Munger. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we will call for the vote. All those in favor of approving ordinance 2020-16, show your hands. It is unanimous. It is approved. Item number eight, take appropriate action to adopt ordinance 2020-17, amending the rules of procedure. Uh, Council, we went through some of this uh, several sessions ago, and so uh, we have taken our rules of procedure, and Letty has done a good job of, number one, cleaning everything up, which was many of the changes, and number two, taking direction from us. So if you will recall, one item was provide a process uh, for excused attendance from council meetings. So I'm looking at page 107 of the packet. Another item was um, updates the council meeting location, which was just wrong. It's kind of a clerical thing that needed to happen. Talks about how we're going to deal with future agenda items. Uh, it removes a designated timekeeper, um, and the mayor shall have this at his discretion. Defers to state statutes on emergency call council meetings. So as opposed to us having to deal with our policies, and that didn't work with COVID and what was being done, we needed a way to make that uh, more flexible. And then we added in a new section provides that the mayor may issue proclamations as needed without council approval. So those were the major changes besides clerical items. Did anybody have anything else they wanted to discuss about this? If not, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve um, ordinance 2020-17, amending ordinance 2017-19. Yeah. Motion to approve item eight. Second. All right, Bone moved, and Schaffner seconded. Any other discussion? No, I just want to uh, thank Letty for doing this for us. Uh, it's much appreciated. Yes, thank you very much. All right, the item was unanimously approved. We, uh, we, we didn't vote. vote. Oh, we didn't? Okay. No. He just, he just, <laughs> there you go. He just take well, it I wrote it down unanimous. <laughs> Now somebody's going to vote where's against Mayor it. Pro Tem? Way down here. <laughs> All those in favor, show your hands. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, given the fact that we just talked about uh, <clears throat> our rules of procedure, we are down to item number nine, discussion of future agenda items. That was on page 124 of your packet. Uh, and um, there are some comments made about uh, the items that we have on the list. Uh, Steve, did you want to say anything? or You know, at our last meeting in August, we, we talked about some of these, and some of them got removed, and we did add one, and that was number five, the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, and I did get some updates from Friesen Nichols, COG, and staff. Uh, so we're, we're in good shape in that area. Uh, and we did address number three, just your previous vote, and the others are pretty self-explanatory. So um, I guess at this point, we can update it and resend it out. And uh, if there's some other items you want to add to it, that's 
perfectly fine. Okay, so this would be a time, uh, because we've agenda this item, that if the council member has an item they wish to add, remember that it would require uh, two council members or the mayor to add something to the future agenda list. So does anybody have anything to add? All right, nothing at this time. We will... Sean, I'm sorry. I don't have anything to add. I just have a question about item one. It says the this is in regards to the uh, the monument entryway and landscaping. It says that it's to be removed. It's a rebid. So I'm a little confused. Is that something we're we're supposed to be revisiting and getting new bids on the on the monumentation, right? Right. You, if you want to, you, we can keep it on. Well, I don't know if it's something that needs to be discussed. I just don't want it to get lost. Okay. Well, the the purpose uh, of this steve was that we didn't lose things okay so uh having it there says that it's going to be there until council begins to deal with it from a number one instruction to rebid okay uh, or number two fund so we'll just scratch the, that the, off the question is do you leave it or not and uh i'm of the opinion you leave it so that you don't forget it if we if it's something important to you council so yeah how do you feel I think it. Okay. Thank you, Sean. All right. So it looked like that uh, consensus was, Steve, to leave item one there so that we continue to look at it. All right. Um, our clock is gone back there, and I'm in the habit of looking up at the clock to tell the time. <laughs> so. 8.13. Yeah. So it's 8.13. And we're going to enter into executive session, item number 10, pursuant to the following designated section of the Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, Open Meetings. The Council will convene into executive session to discuss the following. Uh, discuss the possible action deliberation of the appointment of the Crime Control Prevention District Board members, pursuant to Texas Government Code, Section 551074, Personnel Matters. And item B, discussion and possible action to deliberate the duties and employment of the Town Attorney, pursuant to Texas Government Code, Section 551074. We are in executive session and we'll go take a short break and then go into the side room. Uh, something happened to the time and it was like eight hours off. Yeah. So they took it off the wall, they replaced the batteries, they hadn't been able to set the time. <laughs> so, it is, but without batteries because there's no power to it. It, it talks to the satellite. Council, we will reconvene into regular session. It is 10.01 p.m. Item number 11A, take appropriate action regarding resolution 2020-16, appointment, uh, appointment of members of the Crime Control and Prevention District, and I would recognize Mayor Pro Tem Schaffner for a motion. 16, is it? 16. Because the thing up there says 18. Uh, well, that's wrong. That's yeah, um, I'm going to make a motion and um, just want to make a correction on the agenda item that says ordinance 2020-18. It's I make a motion actually to do uh, resolution 2020-16 to uh, reappoint Mark Bartles, Frederick Lohman, and Heath Williams, and to reaffirm Christopher McAllister, Leo Daniels, Joe Tellez, and J.J. Isherwood. I'll second. Who said? Oh, Sean, did you second? I did. All right. Moved by Schaffner, seconded by Bone. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor, show your hands. It is unanimous. It is done. Item B under this was considered take appropriate action regarding the executive session. Uh, we don't have any further action at this point, and it is uh, 10.03. And we're re adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Mayor, would you like to sign the documents now? Sure. Uh, if you've got a blue pen, because I didn't have a blue I do. And I apologize for the 9-11 stuff, guys. I just saw some stuff 